All right. Bear with us for one moment. We got our audiences logging on to our Zoom as well as our Twitter page uh, and Facebook. So bear with us one moment as we get these technical pieces out the way. All right, we got our folks backstage. How are we doing? We should be up and running in one second. Okay. Now team, I wanna make sure we've got our Zoom flowing. We've got our Zoom going. Can I just have a th thumbs up? Excellent. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening, good evening. So glad to be on our monthly community conference series. Just having some technical issues backstage. Can we just move the uh, assembly logo in the original space? I want to move that assembly logo. Good evening, thank you. Okay. Um, backstage, can we can we move that the logo? And now, now it's covering the seal. Can we, can we move that logo? All right, I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna get started. Um, we're excited to be on. Uh, for folks who are new to our monthly community conference series. Uh, every last Thursday of the month, except for the months where there are holidays, we host our monthly community conference series where we speak to the district. We speak to our community about the issues that are so important um, to moving this community forward. And we're so excited tonight, uh, and tonight's installment is around the issue of transportation justice and equity. And we have so much ground to cover tonight as we're talking about this very heavy subject matter and topic I'm so grateful for all of our amazing panelists um, from all around the city, all different agencies, organizations who are doing the work to ensure that our communities are able to connect. And that's a really, really exciting and important thing uh, for not just our residents here in the 31st Assembly District, our families and our communities here in the 31st Assembly District, but all of Southeast Queens and beyond and all transit desert communities and beyond. So I'm so excited to be on tonight's program with such an amazing panel uh, of hosts. And so on tonight's panel, um, we have the New York City Councilwoman, Sylvina Brooks Powers, who's also the New York City Council Majority Whip and the newly appointed chair of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, I see her chief of staff is on uh, and folks will be cycling in and out um, through to, throughout tonight's panel discussion, because obviously there's so much going on, um, but we're really excited to have the opportunity um, to present, to hear the concerns of our constituency, but also for our agencies, groups, and organizations who are doing the key critical work around this issue of transportation justice can do so. So I want to uh, lob praise uh, and uplifting on our new uh, city councilwoman, uh, also new chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. We're wishing her luck. 
uh, and, and uplifting and empowerment. But I also like to encourage people to adopt a co-governance model where people understand that we're not doing this in a vacuum, but we're doing this together. We're looking to partner and build leadership and build um, ad and address the issues that are impacting our community. So co-governance is important. And that's why we need to have our allies in this space. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Lu Lucille Songhai. She is the Assistant Director of Government and Community Relations. So we're so glad to have you on. Lucille, just wave your hand. Good to see you on. We'll unmute everybody shortly as we're going through the program. So we're really excited about that. Secondly, we have Dorian Stanton. Stanton. I want to make sure I get that right. He's the Director of Bus Planning. I got to get that right because he's planning our buses. Good to see you, Brother Dorian. Glad you're on the call tonight. Um, and lastly, from the MTA, we have Donna Fredrickson. She's the deputy director for, of outreach for Accessoride. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions about Accessoride. So it's so good to see you on the call, Donna. Just wave your hand. Glad you're on the call. And for our folks who are listening in and calling in, this panel is so key, critical, and important because we're bringing people together, stakeholders, and we're talking about the issues that are so important. So I want to thank uh, our panel uh, so far. Next, we have uh, DOT Representative Craig Chin who will be on the call uh, in our second of uh, pa second part of the panel, uh, and a couple other folks who will be in that second segment of the panel. I'm just going by who I see on the call now. We'll circle back to those folks who aren't. Um, we also have uh, Miss Rachel Anton. And she is the JFK Redevelopment Director of Government and Community Relationship Relations, excuse me, uh, for the Port Authority, as well as Jacinta, who's the Operations Manager for Gateway JFK. So both dealing with the JFK Airport in the 31st Assembly District and how critical that transportation hub is for our community. So I'm really excited to have those both those uh, amazing women on the call. Just wave your hand for our viewers. Good to see you, Rachelle, and good to see you, Jacinta. So glad that you're on the call tonight. And our final panelist is Ms. Laura Shepard uh, from Transportation Alternatives, which is an advocacy group and organization that does work around finding alternatives for us to move across the city. So Laura, wave your hand. So glad to have you on the call, on YouTube, on Twitter, and on Instagram tonight as we talk about these key critical issues impacting our district and our community. So I'm glad that you all are on tonight. And so I'm gonna kick off um, with, of course, bringing greetings to everyone as we uh, are filling up the room. So I wanna make sure all of our rooms are filled up. We've got people who are listening in on uh, our Twitter space. It's the first time we've ever used the Twitter space. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we have callers who are, who are senior citizens uh, or using C CCTV um, have the opportunity to call in to our phone line um, on uh, the Zoom call. So we're really excited to have those folks there. We're going to be taking questions from the, the folks who are calling in uh, on Zoom. And we're also live on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as YouTube. So we're really, really excited to be on tonight. Now, without further ado, of course, given our greetings and, of course, the backdrop of tonight's really important community conference series, is talking about transportation deserts and communities that have suffered um, from the inability to get from point A to point B because the infrastructure is so poor across the, across the space and across the span. And our job as legislators, people who are in these spaces, are to help build the divide uh, and, and fill the gaps, but also help improve the quality of life of residents all across uh, the 31st Assembly District in Southeast Queens. So we're really excited. So um, I'm going to bring up our New York City Councilwoman, Sylvina Brooks Powers, again, who was also recently appointed chair of the Committee on Transportation. Welcome on the call, Councilwoman. Introduce yourself. Tell us who you are uh, and how proud you are to be the new chair of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you so much, my assembly member. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, a part of this esteemed panel. My name is Sylvina Brooks Powers and I am the council member for the 31st district representing the communities of 
Laurelton, Rosedale, Brookville, Springfield Gardens, Far Rockaway, Arvern, and Edgemere. Um, the and greatest- Ralph, we'll Say that fast 10 times. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I represent a dynamic community, um, which is in the outer boroughs, um, which has all historically been a transit desert. And so it's such an honor to have been appointed more recently as the chair for transportation and infrastructure. I'm not, not new to transportation. Um, prior to being elected to the New York City Council, I served as the um, one of the managers for external affairs and community outreach for the JFK Redevelopment Program, which um, has now been taken over by the wonderful Rachel um, and looking forward to really building on the work that was done there and in this new space that um, I'm a part of um, and looking to really dismantle some of the um, inequities that we see in the transit system across the city and helping to connect the outer boroughs and um, low income communities, communities of color to the economic centers that exist across this great city. So I'm excited about tonight's conversation. Um, and thank you so much, Assembly Member, for pulling this together on such an important topic and continuing to keep the conversation going around a number of issues in our community that we overlap and share. And I'm blessed to share because this is the first time we've merged transportation and infrastructure, two very key and critical um, areas and interests for the district. So I'm so glad you're on. Um, I have two short questions for you, Councilwoman, because I know you're bouncing around and trying to get across the district, both in person and virtually. This is a working Councilwoman, so we're, we're blessed and thankful to have her. Um, the first question uh, I have for you, Councilwoman, uh, is as the chair of the New York City Council Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, how do you think that New York City, the New York City Council can lead to advanced transportation equity throughout New York City? And you could start by just talking a little bit about how Southeast Queens has struggled with this issue. No, but um, you're, you're hitting it spot on. As I mentioned before, Southeast Queens were historically known as being a transportation des desert, excuse me. And so my mission is really to work to dismantle this inequity that we know persists connecting um, our communities, which often are two fair zones um, to see us receive lesser times in terms of our travel times, making sure that we have more accessibility um, in our communities as well. I know the MTA has their capital plan underway, looking to see more accessibility on our um, Long Island Railroad stations. I have about six train stations in my district. I have um, three Long Island Railroad stations, um, of which you know, most are not really accessible. As you know, in Far Rockaway, our trains are outside and, and, and up high. And those is a lot of steps to say the least. Absolutely. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that they are accessible. We wanted to make sure that they're affordable. Expansion of working with the state to see how we can expand the Freedom Ticket pilot program um, to include Far Rockaway. Also looking at all alternatives and transportation. Um, when we think about Staten Island, when we think about the Bronx, they too have transportation deserts as well. Um, so really looking to leverage um, this particular position to one, listen to the voices across the city, especially here in our community, um, and to begin to work with key stakeholders, whether it be Department of Transportation, MTA, um, you know, all of the, the the advocate groups and our community members and um, listening to where uh, we have the gaps where we can be able to relieve some of the burden. Um, I feel like when we lessen commuting times, it gives people time back to be with their families. And that's to me is a part of quality of life. Um, and so I look forward to working with all the stakeholders, working with you um, to, to seeing some real change as it relates to the transportation network and just being an advocate in that way. Excellent. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. And I want to just uplift some of the comments we're seeing on Facebook. I know you have to jump, but I want to highlight some of the comments you're getting on Facebook. Tanya Cruz sends you praying arms and love. 
Miss um, Veronica Hicks from Springfield Garden is saying good evening. So we're really excited uh, that all the panelists uh, are on tonight, but also our participating audience is sending love and uplifting to our panelists. So we, we wanna thank you for that, Councilwoman. Now, one more quick question before you have to hop off and I'm sure your folks will be on. So if there are any other questions um, that folks have for the new chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, uh, I know her staff will take those questions back to her, um, which is which we're really excited to hear. Now, our last question, Councilwoman, uh, what initiatives do you think the council will be spearheading or what are some that you're really excited to spearhead in the couple of years you named in, in the couple of years in your chairman chairwomanship, I gotta say that now, chairwomanship. Yes. Now chair. uh, <laughs> that's right. We were changing norms. And so um, what are some exciting things that you're you're looking forward to spearheading now? You mentioned a few things that you want to do in the district around uh, transportation equity along the railroad, uh, making the transit uh, more accessible. What are some things that you're super excited to spearhead uh, in your capacity citywide? Yeah, so first and foremost, I'm getting ready to kick off my first 100 days. Um, and what that is going to look like is I am going to be meeting with uh, key stakeholders and advocates in this space. I am going to also go to each of my council member um, colleagues' districts to be able to speak to them and hear firsthand what some of their challenges are. Um, I plan on doing a series of listening tours after I make those visits um, where we will allow the community to really kind of weigh in on the challenges they see. And then we're going to look at trying to um, look legislatively in terms of what we can do. Also, we you know, are anticipating the, the Build Back Better um, funding to start to trickle down once it's fully passed in D.C., um, looking at how that can help also um, in supplementing some of the capital projects that are already underway um, and looking at our infrastructure and how we strengthen them. Um, you know, transportation looks different for everyone, quite honestly. Um, you have some people who prefer um, riding a, a bicycle. There are some people that prefer um, taking the subway. Um, I particularly love taking the subway. Um, I'm also a driver. Um, and in Southeast Queens, we know that we heavily rely on cars because we lack the transit infrastructure here um, where in some communities you have a train station on every few blocks. That's not the reality here. So really looking at how we're able to um, leverage uh, legislation for that, also holding our agencies accountable legislatively, making sure that the community's voices are heard, that we don't see changes in our community without conversation. Those are some of the things that are gonna be um, really important. So right now we're in the listening phase. I wanna be able to, to talk to folks and hear their perspective. I know for the 31st council district, um, some of the things that I would love to see is again, um, seeing elevators installed at some of our stations. I like to uh, see, <clears throat> excuse me, exploration of expansion of the ferry into the Far Rockaway area. You know, we have lots of development underway. We have thousands of new families come into Far Rockaway and we wanna make sure that there are multiple um, ways of coming off of the peninsula as well. We wanna look at how we uh, make our, our buses go faster as well. So there's a lot of work to be done, um, some of which we have oversight of, some that we don't, but we can advocate for. And so looking to really uh, leverage this role to be able to address some of these challenges that we face. And they're, they're longstanding challenges, I'll say. I could think back to when I went to high school in Manhattan. Um, I went to Washington Urban High School and I lived in St. Albans. And to get to school, it would take me a bus and three trains to get to school and imagine having zero period at 7.30 in the morning. And so, you know, I think about all of that time that was spent. Um, and at that time, could, it wasn't about, oh, let me go and take the Long Island Railroad. My parents couldn't afford to put me on the Long Island Railroad every day. So I'm really excited that the Long Island Railroad and um, MTA in particular created the pilot program with the freedom ticket and looking to see that expanded um, so that more people have access to a, a, a quicker route 
outside Absolutely. of Queens. Absolutely. And I, you, you speak of the Atlantic ticket and I, I have a bill on it uh, on the state level. And we're going to continue to push the MTA to ensure that the Rockaways are included um, as a site for the Atlantic ticket. Because just like you said, Councilwoman, it, it would change the quality of life. If I can get home to my family at a godly hour, because I have a transportation link that gets me home a, a lot quicker, that keeps families together, that keeps communities together. And I'm so excited for the possibility of us working together around these issues. And I'm so excited for your leadership, looking forward to partnering with you, continuing to do more discussions around the issue of transportation justice and transportation equity, because I know that you're really passionate and excited about this and generally a passionate person. Um, and we're really excited about that as well. So I'm looking forward to building. Let's, let's continue to build, let's continue to work. And I thank you so much, Councilwoman, for joining our monthly community conference series every last Thursday of the month, 7 p.m. We're, we're live and we're talking about the issues. And we're a year in. This is a year. This month yeah. makes a year um, in doing these community conferences. And I'm excited to host the new chair of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. And looking forward to hopefully getting back down to the district at some point. I'm still here in Albany. But getting back down to the yeah. district. We got some snow coming. Hopefully, we'll be back before the snow. For yes, because so that's a, definitely a hard way to travel with the snow. <laughs> exactly. But, but thank you yeah. so much for the the platform um, to be here and talk about transportation. Um, I I do have to run, but I will be trying to listen in at the same time. I haven't tried that Twitter. What is it called? I'm learning it myself. Twitter Space. It's like a Twitter little space. podcast. Type so I'm going to see if I can have it playing in one ear. Um, to just stay connected. But thank you everyone for allowing me to be a part of this. I see Rick is on here about the Queens link. Hey, Rick, I'm looking forward to meeting with you and, and starting back up that conversation. Um, hello, Tanya. Tanya is a gem in Southeast Queens. She is our number one transportation advocate in Southeast Queens, as far as I'm concerned. Love Tanya. Community I love Tanya. 13. And so thank you once again, and everyone have a great evening. Take care, Councilwoman. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move on to our second panelist um, and the second phase of our panel, uh, which is our folks from the New York City Transit uh, MTA. So we have, again, Ms. Lucille Songhai. I hope I'm saying it right. Then we have, uh, who's the Assistant the Director of Government and Community Relations. We have Dorian Stantum, Director of Bus Planning. Uh, and we have Donna Fredrickson, the Deputy Director of Outreach for the Accessor Ride. So we're so excited to have you three on the call. You can unmute uh, and say hello to our audiences, and I'll get right into questions. But you, Good quick evening, intro, say everyone. hello to the audiences, and I'll get right into questions. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Assemblymember, for inviting us and having us here this evening. Thank you, Lucio. All right, Dorian. Oh, hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Dorian State. I'm, I'm director for Bus Network Redesign at the MTA. And good evening, everyone. I'm Donna Fredrickson from uh, Paratransit Accessoride. I'm a Queens resident of the Rockaways. So <laughs> thank you for having me. All right. Which part of the Rockaways you said you were from? Did you say? No, I'm from I'm, no, I'm oh. from Queens, but we're often at the beach <laughs> walking on the boardwalk. It's so beautiful. So beautiful You're down in there. You're entitled to your passport <laughs> to visit. <laughs> we love to see it. it. So thank you so much for being on. Um, and tonight I really want to dive deep into what public transportation has been uh, during the pandemic. Obviously, a lot of people um, you know, have been shafted or, or had issues with public transportation or have had positive experiences with transportation. There's just a wide ranging uh, level of experiences as it relates to transportation uh, coming through the pandemic. And so I want to get a sense of how the agency has been able to bounce back um, as, we're, as we're fighting you know, through the pandemic. Um, that's for either one of the three panelists from the MTA. So I'll start this evening. So I think, you know, as you said, we have all been impacted and we have all been changed by this pandemic. Um, in terms of the MTA, while we were sort of in the thick of things in 2020, um, we still kept trains and buses moving. 
uh, which you know allowed our essential employees to continue to do the work of the city. Um, but ridership has been impacted. So currently we are operating at around 60% of pre-pandemic ridership levels on the subway. And then for buses, we are operating at 70% of our pre-pandemic ridership. Um, and so, you know, I think what we're seeing is that with the advent of, you know, hybrid and remote work options for employees, um, there's been a shift in terms of ridership into Manhattan. Um, and we're seeing that in, particularly in the neighborhoods of Southeastern Queens, Many of the residents work in the medical field. They work as essential employees. And so through the pandemic, a lot of that ridership remained steady. Uh, we didn't really see a decrease. We saw that the ridership in areas around Jamaica and Rosedale and Laurelton and the Rockaways, all of those communities, the ridership has remained pretty steady. Um, and I think, you know, while the decision was made at the time to sort of pare back service, the 24 hour service sort of during the height of the pandemic, we were really thrilled to invite people to come back to the system um, and to utilize the system. But I think, you know, the world is changing. I think the ways in which people are utilizing transit are changing and, and it's not so Manhattan centric. And I know that we'll get in a little bit later talking about sort of the new Interborough Express project um, that has seen a lot of excitement. But I think it really goes to show that we are really trying to make investments um, outside of Manhattan, because people in Queens like to travel to Brooklyn. They're working in Brooklyn. They're working within their borough in Queens. And so we want to be able to provide better opportunities for people to connect to those places that have nothing to do with Manhattan. And, you know, no shade to Manhattan, but, you know, we want to ensure that residents around the boroughs have an opportunity to utilize transit and get to where they need to go. Um, a lot of our capital programs at the time were paused, um, dur again, during the height of the pandemic. Um, but we're starting to see that those projects are picking back up, which is exciting. Um, and then financially, um, in the early days of the pandemic, I mean, you know, the drop, the precipitous drop in ridership uh, was really concerning for us, uh, mainly because we were concerned that we were not going to have enough funding to continue to make these critical infrastructure Absolutely. investments in the system. Mm -hmm. um, but again, thanks to the dedication of our New York federal delegation um, and other partners, you know, with stimulus money, as well as the recently passed infrastructure bill in DC, um, we were able to sort of plug some of the really important gaps in our budgets to again, continue to make critical investments and keep our workforce employed and, and moving. Which is so important and we really appreciate you know, the work that MTA has been doing to help restore the agency. I think I saw the W train just come back this week, which um, it doesn't directly affect my constituents, but it's another mode of transportation that gets folks from point A to point absolutely. B. Absolutely. I'm sure there's some transfer points. And, you know, I think just in terms of a lot of, uh, you know, different folks, I mean, we have been impacted by this recent Omicron surge. Um, and so, again, we had to sort of make strategic decisions to, again, get people to where they needed to go. Um, but also recognizing the challenges of the fact that a lot of our workforce was out due to sickness. Um, and so thankfully, you know, uh, folks are starting to come back to work. We were able to restore some of the lines that we had to, uh, you know, put on standby. And yeah, we're just looking forward to continuing to bring people to where they need to go uh, in the best and most efficient way possible. Thank you so much um, for your work, Lucille, uh, in that effect. And we're really excited to continue to help um, steer the, the MTA in the right direction around how we can help address the issue of transportation equity. Um, now, I guess this question definitely will go uh, for you, Dorian. Thank you so much uh, for being on tonight. Um, before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, took us all by storm, we were knee deep in uh, an active but also controversial bus redesign project um, to ensure that we could help make sure that our buses are adequately connecting um, our constituents, our residents, our friends, our family, our neighbors um, to different parts of the city, different parts uh, of Queens. 
Uh, and so, you know, that was obviously halted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you think Southeast Queens can get its fair share with bus routes? And what does that sort of um, discussion look like as we're coming out on the other side of this pandemic? I know that was like two questions, a little heavy, no, but let's jump in. No problem. Uh, so as you know, we started the Queens redesign back in 2019, and we did have a pause after we released a draft plan, which was not well received. Um, there were some issues with that for sure, but we had this 18 month pause. And back in October of last year, we announced that we were restarting the redesigns um, with the Bronx, but also announced earlier this year that in the Q1 of this year, we will, we will be releasing a new draft plan for Queens. Um, and the good thing about the pause that we had the 18 months, we really were able to, we received over 11,000 comments um, on the Queens plan when we were out talking to community. We had lots of community meetings. Uh, we met with lots of folks. It was only a three month window, but we really got a lot of comments during that time. Um, and a lot of that has informed our decision. So this, our, our plan. So this new plan that we're coming out with in, later in Q1 really is taking, is really a community plan, right? We look at the, a lot of the feedback we received and we, that has really informed and has been the guiding force behind creating this new plan um, that is responding to a lot of the feedback that we received um, and really aligning with our what our customer priorities are. Um, in terms of equity, I think a lot of, movement has been made over the last 18 months, at least from the MTA's perspective, like really kind of coming up with a consistent definition of equity and and really kind of trying to develop a transparent approach to how we evaluate the impact on equity communities and also how we can facilitate these positive impacts on kind of like on, on social vulnerable communities that have stor historically been marginalized. Um, and we historically we've done this more on a project by project basis, but I think with the redesigns is really an opportunity to kind of develop a more consistent approach um, across many service planning projects. And the redesign is obviously a huge effort. Uh, and so we are developing a kind of an equity framework so that we can make sure that we're evaluating uh, service and also prioritizing investments in these in equities er equity areas. Um, did that answer your question or? Yes, and 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 I want to before I respond really quickly, I want to apologize to our um, call-in audience. I think we were having some issues with the audio, but you should be able to hear um, the speakers now. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being on. And for folks who don't catch uh, our community conference series live, it's always on our YouTube page. Uh, we record these and save store them on my YouTube channel at Khalil Anderson or at Assembly Member Khalil Anderson. And we're excited. Look, we want to make sure that we get these folk in. We talk about the topics and the things that are so important to the district, um, but most importantly, we hear the voices of the stakeholders here in the community who are faced with these issues. So Dorian, thank you so much for just sort of answering that question around sort of the anxiety um, that had developed yeah. before COVID-19 around the bus redesign. I'm glad that the MTA is taking public comments, which is so important. No one knows their bus route uh, better than Ms. Johnson, who takes the same bus every day, or better than, I'm telling you, or Mrs. Smith, you don't want, you don't want to make her miss her bus, and, 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 uh, or him, uh, Mr. Johnson. So it's important. And so I'm glad that you're on the call tonight, just sharing the importance of how we have to bridge the gap between the communities of color um, that have historically been left behind and forgotten about uh, as it relates to transportation. Look, it's no secret that we have very few trains or train infrastructure yeah. here in Queens. Um, the councilwoman talked about folks who bike. Um, we talked about folks who unfortunately have to drive in this space because uh, of the poor truck transportation infrastructure. Um, but we rely so heavily on our buses uh, and on our trains. Mm -hmm. uh, and also dollar vans uh, have been a way for folks to get from point A and to point B. And I know that we are expecting someone, uh, a panelist tonight, to speak a little bit about um, uh, that mode of transportation. So I'm looking forward um, to that. So let me um, talk uh, about accessibility. As we have the, uh, um, the panel on tonight, I wanna talk about the accessibility and this can go to either one of the three panelists here from the MTA. Um, how do we ensure more accessibility upgrades? Um, and how does Accessoride work to help address the issues of accessibility here in the 31st Assembly District? So I'll take the first part and then I will pass it on to my colleague Donna to talk more about Accessoride. So 
accessible stations is a top priority for us at the MTA and currently as part of our current capital program, we are investing in over 70 new ADA state or ADA uh, elevators in stations. And um, I think we're getting one in the district. And in particular in the Rockaways, Beach 67th Street yes. is one of those stations. And so we are going to continue um, to make those investments in each capital program. Sort of the metric that we have been trying to use is that after these 70 elevators are installed, customers will not be uh, more than two subway stations away from an accessible station. Um, obviously with the goal of making all stations accessible. Um, and even with some of the newer projects that have been uh, being discussed again, like Interboro uh, Express, all of that new infrastructure would be ADA compliant and fully accessible. Um, as part of the infrastructure bill that was passed in DC uh, at the end of 2021, um, it actually provides for discretionary monies uh, for systems like ours that were built prior to the ADA. Um, so this is going to allow us to pursue additional federal monies for ADA projects throughout the system. Um, we also are going to leverage and use uh, some of our private partnerships in places where it makes the most sense uh, to have a sort of a public private partnership of investing and in building new elevators um, and using sort of the existing zoning regulations to help make that happen. Um, and so I'll now pass it over to my colleague Donna to talk about Accessoride. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I want to say, too, Accessoride continued running throughout uh, the pandemic. Uh, only we returned at 80% <laughs> capacity uh, pre-COVID. So it's it, it's amazing. Um, we were um, our numbers were like 7,000 trips per day um, during um, the height of COVID and the people we were transporting around the city were those who desperately needed to get to life-saving treatments like dialysis and chemo, but also two essential workers who were out there um, really, you know, supporting our hospitals and, and working there as well. So what is Accessoride? Accessoride is public transportation, just like our buses and subways, but for people with disabilities. So a disability can be a more long-term or it can be like for me, a knee replacement. And I use the Accessoride as I'm healing. A lot of people don't realize that it's not just for seniors, it's for anyone, any age who has a disability that's preventing them from using the subway or our 100% accessible buses. We understand that some customers can't get to their nearest bus or can't get to an accessible station. And that's where we fill in for them. Who provides the service and when do we provide the service? We operate just like MTA 24-7 throughout the five boroughs of New York City. So we're here to help people no matter what time of day they want to travel. However, with Accessoride, you do have to call one to two days in advance to book your trips. Um, you can book them uh, by phone, you can book them online or through our wonderful MTA app, My MTA. So there's different ways in which you can do it. And customers can also track their trips with the app, which is pretty cool because you can see when where your vehicle is and when it will be arriving. So those are some great tools. How do you start using Accessoride? It begins with a call, a simple call um, uh, to 877-337-2017. And you want to speak with someone uh, Monday through Friday from nine to five. You're just going to hit prompt number one and talk with someone in our eligibility unit and they'll talk you through the application process. Everybody applying for the service does have to go for an in-person assessment so we can best understand the transportation you need. What does that mean? Accessoride is not just our blue and white vans. Um, folks can use our taxis and our broker service to get around. So we've really expanded and really understood the um, our customers and their specific needs. Not everybody needs a lift equipped vehicle, but they're there if you do. In fact, one of our carriers is based out in the Rockaways, Old Transit. So we're here to, to help you get through that. Again, um, I just wanted to say a little bit about what we did during um, 
COVID, um, a lot of folks needed the service uh, immediately. They may have never had the service before, but they found that they needed the service immediately. And we gave over 45,000 folks presumptive eligibility so they could get to those life-saving treatments with hopes of having them come in for that in-person assessment when things calm down with the pandemic. And we were able to open our assessment centers fully. So we're here to help folks uh, get on the service, use the service, please, please, please feel free to visit our website, mta.info. In the upper um, left-hand corner, you can drop down the menu and click on Accessoride and read our latest newsletter. Our new newsletters are posted quarterly, so I invite folks to please read that. I could talk forever, uh, and Lucille knows no. that. I even had a PowerPoint to show you all, but forget it. By the time I put it on, I'll be done. <laughs> well, but listen, Donna, we're gonna Donna, we're gonna definitely have you back at one of our community conferences, if not. <laughs> do a pop-up because we do have a lot of constituent issues around Accessoride. Uh, we want to continue to make sure that the system is accessible um, to people who need uh, and need ADA compliance um, to, to be a thing to get around the city. So Absolutely. Donna, this is our first, but not our last. And we're really, really excited to have you on because there's so many ways in which we can help get people from point A to point B. Can you talk a little bit, Donna, about how um, the policies or procedures have changed with Accessoride, um, you know, as we're coming hopefully on the other end of this pandemic. And what what are some ways also, second part of that question, what are some ways if people are having issues with uh, their Accessoride can get assistance? So I do want to say during um, the height of the pandemic, we um, did a lot of things like we stopped, like with MTA and New York City, we stopped payment um, so that folks didn't, ha you know, they were concerned about touching money and things like that. And that was understandable. So we stopped that. But we also stopped our feeder service, which we still haven't returned yet. That means some folks can still take a bus or a subway, but the problem is getting to that subway or bus. So we provide the service halfway because Accessoride in many cases works in conjunction with mass transit. So our goal is to get you to that point. So we did um, uh, stop that. And of course, like I just said, with our eligibility process, knowing the difficulties during um, uh, COVID, during the, the height of COVID, that we needed to get people on the service and going. So we had all of those things set up for our customers to help them get around the city during this difficult time. However, during um, COVID, yeah. something else has happened. We have a lack of drivers, so we're looking for drivers. If you know of drivers and they're interested in, and they have a CDL license and would like to uh, serve their community, we'd love to have them. And I could definitely supply you guys with a list and numbers to reach out to them. So we're always looking for more drivers. That was one of the things we've had to contend with as well as traffic. Traffic, had, I don't know if anybody's tried to drive. I know just around Queens, it's impossible. So Absolutely. people need to have more patience when they're using Accessoride. Over 85% of our trips are direct trips, meaning we'll pick you up and take you exactly there, but it's hard to serve all of our customers. Let me just give you an example. Today, there were over 18,900 trips scheduled throughout the five boroughs of New York City. Wow. So wow. we have to schedule that. And sometimes, yes, you may be with someone else, but we understand uh, about social distancing and things like that. So we try to only have you in that vehicle for a short time. And we do encourage all of our customers to please think about getting vaccine if you can. Um, our drivers uh, on December 27th, they've all had their first uh, shot, if not uh, their booster and everything else, but um, and will be vaccinated uh, with their second shot or booster soon. So a lot of them already have been vaccinated. So uh, we do ask everyone to wear masks, just like on all public transportation, please wear your mask. So there's a lot of little things we've done to keep the service going and make it a little easy for folks, um, especially those who might have COVID and uh, might have symptoms. We do have a special route set up for folks like that. So, it, it, you know, people think, oh, we don't care, but we really do. And there's folks here who are able to help. If you have any issues with your service, please call again, the toll free number 877-337-2017. You'd press number eight to put in a complaint or a question and one of us will get back in touch with you. Of course, you can go online and go to contact us at mta.info. Um, to file a complaint or a question that way um, or call your office and you guys definitely can reach out to Lucille or myself and we'll try our help to help. Uh, Absolutely. Our and, 
And Donna, I'm going to take you up on that offer now. I, I, I think I've told this to Lucille before, but before I got into this whole politics thing, I did want to be a bus driver. But in any case, um, I was <laughs> going to drive. I was going to drive the B45 bus in Brooklyn. I'm telling you. Um, but in any case, um, I'm going to take you up on that offer of of trying Please. to connect our constituents to jobs because I know that we have the accessorized site in Harvard. We yeah. know one of your um, helpers there in the office, William. He yes. was a temp with us. So uh, he can call us directly or Linda Edmond directly. There you go. Um, there we and go. We'll be happy to help. So shout out to William. Um, <laughs> and uh, he worked with and us for a while. Appropriately, before. William's our transportation guy, Donna. So, <laughs> you know, he's definitely been coordinating and working with folks. So we're really, really excited for Mr. Bow and the work that he's doing in our office. But um, Donna, definitely send out some information to our office so we can get it out I to our will. constituents about the jobs. Cause we know that we have the site in the back of Arvern on 74th street. Um, right. And we want to make sure that people know about the employment opportunities. And if they don't know how to get their CDL, we can work with our partners yeah. at, at yeah. Um, JFK redevelopment, our partners at gateway JFK and many partners throughout the district to try to get them connected to workforce one um, so they can get uh, those CDLs going. So thank okay. you so much, Donna. Thank you so much, Donna. Last, last question uh, and quick answer if we can um, for our MTA panel. Can you just folks quickly touch on the Interborough Express? Um, I know that we had some newly announced um, continuation of the Interborough Express uh, in the recent news. The governor talked uh, deeply about it. So you guys want to touch a little bit about uh, what the Interborough Express is as we Close out the Absolutely. MTA panel. Absolutely. So this uh, new uh, express uh, train line would be built along the existing Bay Ridge cord, uh, Bay Ridge connector, which is an existing 14 mile freight line that extends all the way from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn to Jackson Heights, Queens. Um, it will create a new transit option for up to 900,000 residents of the neighborhoods along those routes, along with about 260,000 people who work in Brooklyn and in Queens. Um, it would also connect folks up to 17 different train lines, subway lines, as well as Long Island Railroad stations with end-to-end -end travel times uh, between Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, about uh, 40 minutes. So it would be a game changer. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we just recently released as part of uh, this project was a feasibility study, um, which looks at sort of the best modes of transit um, to be considered. So there are three modes that they're sort of looking at. One would be a traditional rail, uh, sort of similar to what, uh, you know, a subway car would look like now. Um, they're also considering light rail, um, which sort of, you know, looks sort of more like the high speed uh, train systems that you see in other places, um, along with a bus option, sort of an express, you know, you know, full bus option going along that corridor. Um, some exciting things about this project um, would be that, you know, the the freight line that they would be using is exist since is existing would cut down on a lot of the construction. Um, of, of this project. And so we would really be able to speed things up. Um, but I think this really connects back with what uh, Council Member Brooks Powers was talking about when she was speaking with us earlier about how do we connect Queens residents uh, to other parts of the city that are just not Manhattan. Um, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, places of economic growth have the opportunity to, to really experience that growth by seeing the population really moving there um, and, and taking advantage of all of the resources of, of getting to those locations. Um, so we're really excited about it. Um, I welcome people. We have a new um, on our MTA website. So folks can go to new.mta.info slash projects slash Interborough Express. And I'll make sure to, of course, share this with uh, the assembly member's office, just so that, you know, for any of the uh, communications you're sending out to the community, that folks can access the site. You can read the fe feasibility study. You can take a look 
um, at the uh, the different options that uh, we're we're looking at and examining. And then, you know, coming up very soon, there will be a uh, a myriad of community meetings. Um, and, and ways for folks to engage on this topic. Um, but we really, you know, I think we have really seen a real excitement from all kinds of folks, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, across and the borough on this project. Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to be doing my part to make sure that we uh, pass a budget this year that includes more funding for the MTA so we can focus on accessibility. So we can focus on the transportation issues that we have, but most, most important, I'm gonna be pushing y'all on this Atlantic ticket because it's the best way to get residents from the Rockways into the city. So I'm so grateful for all of our partners who are on the call tonight uh, with the MTA. I wanna shout out one of my constituents who's on the call, Chris Tedesco uh, of Community Board 14, who's a member of the Community Board 14 Transportation Committee. Thank you so much, Chris, um, for being on the call tonight. Uh, lastly, oh, go ahead, Lucille. So I just also wanted to add when you talked about sort of accessibility and affordability, um, just in Governor Hochul's uh, proposed budget, uh, we are looking at not increasing the fares for 2022. Um, so again, we're really looking at how do we bring people back into the system and then how do we keep them there um, by making sure that, you know, at least at this point for 2022, um, that we don't have to increase the fares, that we can keep them as is. Absolutely. And we're going to be working towards that because um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that folks have a, a stable way to get from point A to point B. And the income piece is always a big, big thing that keeps folks away from public transportation uh, or kind of creates that barrier. So we're really excited to help break those barriers and help people get from point A. Um, to point B. Last question, and I know that our office will share your contact information uh, so that folks can reach out, whether it's a complaint, whether it's to, to publicly comment on a project or anything of that sort. Um, but starting with you, Dorian, do you want to share if folk are having issues with the Q22 bus or issues with the QM17 bus, express bus, uh, or having issues with any of our buses, Q85, Q5, I can name all the routes in my district, Q77, um, what's the best way they can contact the MTA to share their concerns about the uh, efficiency of, uh, of the buses? And then the same thing for our trains. And you already answered the question, Donna, for accessory rides. So I thank you so much for that. But uh, Dorian and then Lucille, and then we'll close out the MTA panel. Actually, Lucille's the right person. Um, yeah, the I'm the right person. person. That's right. That I'm learning. Um, I'm learning. No, it does it's what? All good. So obviously the best way you can call us, you can go on our website, you can leave a comment, you can call 311. Um, you know, one of the other ways that we hear a lot uh, on transportation issues are from our legislators. So if you have an issue with your bus, uh, you know, it's always great to contact the assembly member's office, some really important information that we need, you know, what time did you try and get on the bus? What direction were you headed in? Um, and then really, you know, give us what the issue is. Um, you know, part of my every day in this job is communicating with our, uh, you know, road operations team. And those are the folks that are supervising the operators on the street. Um, and so I'm in very close contact with them. Um, and then, you know, if it comes to things like needing to make adjustments to schedules and those other things, um, as soon as I get that information, I sort of like disseminate it out to the uh, appropriate internal teams and we have conversations on those. So, you know, if it's a bus stop that you're having an issue with, we have a bus stop management team that actually goes out. They sit at the bus stop, they evaluate the buses coming and going. And if they're, you know, whatever issues are up, you know, they really sit there and they analyze it um, and then they bring it back and we try to, to make adjustments as is. Um, you know, as always, uh, we're not perfect, but we are always going to try our best to uh, address the issues at hand. Um, and we just, you know, ask for patience and grace, uh, you know, because again, as we all have been impacted, we're all just sort of working with what we have. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of any, you know, subway issues, bus issues, you know, the community board is another really great avenue, I, you know, hear from Chris and Dolores from CB14 often. 
uh, on various issues, as well as the other community boards uh, around Southeast Queens. So the community board is also a really great grassroots way to let us know what's going on and just your, your legislators. Um, we also have WhatsApp. Um, and so, you know, you can communicate with our uh, customer service teams via WhatsApp. You can That's excellent. Twitter. I didn't know that. That's excellent. You can WhatsApp. That through WhatsApp. So yes, That's that exciting. also means that uh, for language access, we're able to actually communicate with folks uh, multilingually. So, you know, not just using English as the, as the primary language, we're able to really meet folks where they're at. Uh, you know, we also communicate with people via Twitter and via Facebook, um, not so much via Instagram, but, you know, we have a lot of different public channels uh, to reach us. And so, um, you know, I, I ask people to just, you know, utilize as much as you can. Um, but, you know, a really great resource, obviously, is the Assembly Members Office. Um, Carl and William and Christina and Monette, you know, your whole team has been really great. Um, really getting us information uh, to, to really serve your constituents. So we look forward to continuing to do that. Um, but yes, there are a myriad of ways to reach us. And, you know, again, I will be sure to send you some of that information, assembly members, so that you can disseminate that out in your newsletters and in your communications to your constituents. Thank you so much, Lucille, uh, Dorian, and Donna all from the MTA, um, from Bus Operations, Dwayne uh, Stanton, thank you so much for being on. Lucille Rose, who does, uh, Lucille Songhai, I'm sorry, who does everything. We love and appreciate you for, for how active you are and very responsive you are. I had an issue last week and you were on top of it uh, at the Mott Avenue train station, so I really appreciate that. And Donna, for helping our folk who need ADA accessibility get around the city. It's so key, critical, and important. And as we get through um, learning about this Interboro Express, we get through this COVID-19 pandemic and, and, and start discussing the bus redesign. I'm getting a lot of comments tonight uh, in regards to the Queens Rail. And that's a later discussion that we will have uh, and continuing to look at ways we can balance the need for access, uh, but also the needs uh, of our communities and green space and, and community um, space for our neighbors. So, we will get to that conversation. So I thank all of our folks who are participating both on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the folks who are calling in on our Zoom call. We're so thankful uh, for your participation. Thank you so much to the MTA panel. We'll bring up our next panelist. Thank you all. We will bring up our next panelist for our next uh, segment of tonight's community conference. For folks who are just joining every last Thursday of the month, 7 p.m. You can find me here on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Zoom, bringing information directly to the constituents, speaking about issues uh, that impact the district. And this month, we're talking about transportation equity, uh, and we're talking about transportation justice for a community that's a transit desert. Uh, from much of my district, uh, from point A to point B, it's super hard to get to. It takes me by car about an hour and a half from end to end to get across my district. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, by bus, it takes even that much longer. Um, and so I'm thankful for our partners who are on the call tonight uh, for our advocacy, expertise, and resource sharing segment of tonight's panel. For folks who are just jumping on, we have Laura Shepard, um, who is with Transportation Alternatives. Laura, you can unmute and say hello to the audience. Y'all have been super patient. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Laura, for being on. We have Rachelle from the JFK Redevelopment Project. Rachelle, you should unmute and say hello. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me, member. Excellent. And then we have Jacinta from Gateway JFK. For folks who don't know uh, what and where J Gateway JFK is, Jacinta, introduce yourself and tell us where you are. Hello, everybody. My name is Jacita Jean. Um, I'm the operations manager for Gateway JFK. Uh, Gateway JFK is actually right in the heart of assembly member Khalil Anderson's district. Um, and we also have the pleasure of having Councilwoman um, Brooks Powers as one of our councilwomen. And we also share that with Councilmember Adams. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great. I'm happy to be here. Uh, tonight to speak a little bit about Dollar Ride and the great things that Gateway JFK is doing. So excited to hear about that. And 
Um, I'm looking at myself in the camera and I see my bookshelf. Folks are seeing my bookshelf is empty because I just moved in this part of the office. So we're going to get that fixed. Uh, we're going to have some nice books up there. But in any case, <laughs> in any case, let's get right into it. Um, we have a bunch of questions that we want to ask our folks who are doing advocacy, like transportation alternatives, but our experts, folks who are doing the resources right here in the district um, as well, and uh, Jacinta as well as Rochelle. So we're really excited about that. The first question I want to ask, uh, and this goes to any one of the three of you, um, how does the lack of public transportation access options impact um, transportation ridership in Southeast Queens? For you, Jacinta, first dollar ride specifically, um, and then open to the rest of the panelists. How does uh, the lack of transportation op options impact the ridership on dollar ride specifically? Well, essentially, as you all may know, and we've been reciting this throughout uh, tonight's conversation, Southeast Queens is a transportation desert. But at the same time, Dollar Ride is in no way shape here to compete with MTA. We serve as an incentive for the residents of Southeast Queens and also the employees of Southeast Queens. And um, essentially since launching um, April 1st, which was our pilot phase. And I was uh, there, you know, I love to yes. cut a good ribbon. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I am excited to say that we have provided over 33,000 rides, literally in the district, um, starting from Rockaway Boulevard and Garabrul, which is our starting point, um, and ending at Archer and Sufton Boulevard. You know, so we know that folks are using the system. And another thing um, that I might add is, no offense to MTA, no shade, but uh, Dollar Listen, Ride- Listen, they're not on the call, we can talk. I, I don't know. <laughs> Safe space, safe space. To be 31% faster than the Q6. So obviously we know we have a problem, okay? But we do have a solution that can somewhat provide an alternative for customers in Southeast Queens to ensure that they have reliable transportation, getting them to and from work and home, you know? So yeah, that's, that's what we have for tonight. And how much does Dollar Ride cost? Is it really a dollar? No, <laughs> Dollar Ride is not a dollar. I, I honestly would prefer Dollar Ride to be free, but that's another conversation. Um, we have to have that conversation. The, we have to have that conversation. But right now it is $2. Um, so, you know, it's a great little tool. You can just download the app and, you know, our constituent Southeast Queens residents can literally just pay for it right there, like on their phone. So... No really exchanging good. of like cash. So think of like the Uber for buses. Mm -hmm. That's what Dollar Ride is. And we appreciate that, Jacinta. Questions open to the rest of our panelists. What are we doing or how are y'all active in the space? Now, we understand the lack of transportation options here in Southeast Queens, but how does your organization, how does your group help bridge some of those issues? Um, I can chime in here. Good uh, morning, so Laura. Hi, so we love your background. Thank you. Thank you. So we hear a lot from a lot of outer borough residents and people in transportation deserts that they would like to be able to ride their bikes uh, often as part of a multimodal commute to get to uh, their nearest subway, to get to a Long Island Railroad stop or even to a bigger transit hub like downtown Jamaica or Flushing. And uh, Often the thing that's stopping people, the thing that's really the major barrier is just how unsafe the streets are when you want to ride a bike in a lot of these communities. Um, often the only way to do it is by riding on dangerous arterials where there's a lot of speeding, a lot of cars, trucks, SUVs, and chaotic double parking. And then on the other end, there's often no secure bike parking, nowhere to leave your bike during the day uh, once you've hopped on the train. And so we can really address this. Uh, thank you. Uh, the MTA bike access bill just passed and this starts a conversation with the MTA about better bike access on its bridges and also uh, just bike parking at its stations to make them more accessible for people. And this, the, the time savings and the benefits will really be felt especially uh, in transportation deserts because it'll spare people from 
long walks to the bus, long waits for buses that run really un infrequently, and uh, in some cases, just fewer transfers. Yeah, and I think that that's really important. I'm so glad you sort of touched on that, Laura. Uh, just a quick plug. I bought a bike um, last week. I've been trying to do uh, less of my car, but it's harder because it's hard to get from the district up to Albany or even across the district. But whenever I'm in my district office, I try to ride from my office uh, to from my house to my office. But, you know, just like you said, uh, tr safety, right? Uh, a lot of our crosswalks uh, and a lot of the intersections that we have to cross are unsafe. Um, senior citizens are concerned. Um, our folks who need ADA compliance are concerned. And my office is going to continue to work with uh, not only our partners in the city council and um, uh, uh, our new chair of the transportation committee, because she's been a big supporter of that issue and making sure that our sidewalks are accessible. Um, but also I'm excited that uh, the speaker of the New York City Council is a uh, Southeast Queens local. We share a third of my district currently, and this is an issue that we've been battling uh, both through our community boards uh, and uh, a lot of the issues that are happening on the local level. Uh, and just trying to make sure people understand that we, there's other ways that we can continue to increase access, um, better walking paths and equity uh, and transportation options. So I appreciate your work on that, Laura. What are some ways that folk uh, can get in contact with your organization or become more active um, Laura, with your organization, and then I have a question for you, uh, Ms. Rachel, about JFK and that transportation hub. Yeah, and I'll, and remember, I'll definitely add to your previous question as okay. well afterwards. Thank you so much. Laura? Sure. So uh, I'd absolutely love it if people could reach out. Um, transportation Alternatives advocates for better walking, biking, and public transit throughout New York City and mm -hmm. beyond. And uh, we have monthly activist committee meetings. Um, the Eastern Queens Committee meets on the third Monday of every month. Uh, you can always reach out to me at queens at transalt.org or follow us on social media, on Twitter, and on Facebook. And uh, we really encourage people to share their experiences, their commutes, and highlight the challenges that they face just trying to walk um, walk to school safely, to get to work, um, to even to bike to the park, everything, and uh, and bring this experience to our elected officials and to our community boards. We absolutely encourage everybody to apply uh, for their local community boards because these boards really need to hear these experiences and. Uh, have membership that reflects the way New Yorkers get around. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And Rachel, you wanted to add on to that. Yeah, definitely. Your question actually took me back to my college days at your college. Um, and I know that we have a plenty of panelists here who spoke about the MTA, the dollar van. For me, right in Southeast Queens, Queens Village, I had the pleasure throughout my, my whole four years of college taking the $2 cab, right? And so those $2 cab plays a major role in my education here in Southeast Queens. So when I'm running to school, um, trying to get to class, I, I had to rely on that transportation. So uh, member, I really thank you for embracing this conversation as a whole, because when we're speaking about transportation equity, we're not only speaking about resources that are available to the com community accessibility, we're also speaking about jobs. So it, it reminds me of those taxi drivers that are making a living out of that. So I, I look forward to see the work that, you know, the Southeast Queens elected officials will continue to do, especially with you and the assembly to continue to regulate policies around these, um, these type of transportation. And I also had a minor experience where uh, my finger was actually closing one of those doors of a dollar wow. cat. And I wow. really couldn't proceed with, you know, calling mm -hmm. the insurance because I felt really bad uh, for the driver. So I think when we're talking about accessibility, it's, you know, low uh, folks from low income family, middle classes that are finding ways to make a living and also finding a ways to regulate these type of jobs for members of the community. Yeah. And I thank you so much <clears throat> for that, Rachel. And I thank you uh, Laura, as, as well as Jacinta, 
for tonight, just really just diving deep into how we could work to address and resolve some of the issues around transportation. Um, and I want to just take a moment to thank all of our panelists from the MTA um, to our folks at Gateway JFK, to our folks at Transportation Alternatives, uh, as well as our city councilwoman whose staff is in the backstage, making sure that she takes in all the questions for her and our team to take a look. So I want to just start to dive into some of those questions. I know we have a lot of different platforms that we're operating off of tonight. I want to get into our Zoom. I know we're going to have some questions on Twitter. My staff is trying to pull in those questions as well. But if we don't get to them, we want to keep them close and, and email them out uh, to tonight's panelists. So we're so thankful um, for that. So I want to go to, let me see if I can pull a question from our Zoom. I think it was an accessibility question I just saw from our Zoom. Let me take this comment first, and then I'll get to this question. Ronald Britt, um, thank you, Ron, for always being on, member of Community Board 13 in Springfield Gardens, South Hills on part of Springfield Gardens and Rosedale, excuse me. We need a safe and dignified transportation hub for Jamaica. EJZ subway and the bus terminals must be funded in the capital plan for a major overhaul. Please stop ignoring the very busy Jamaica hub. Thank you, Ronald, um, for your advocacy on that because uh, let's face it, folks who live in the Rockways transfer in downtown Jamaica, they need that opportunity to get from point A to point B safely uh, in a clean space, but also in a space that helps um, make that process simpler. So I know that was more of a comment than a question. I do think we had a question here from a constituent who asks about bus shelters, but I know that the MTA has logged off, um, but I will take it. And um, we had a senior ask, how can we get more uh, bus shelters to, pe to protect people who have to sit um, and don't want to get rained on or snowed on? Um, that's a really important question, and we will definitely make sure we get that answer for you from the MTA. Uh, as we're seeing more of our bus shelters uh, and the, I know that there was a movement uh, a couple of years ago that removed some of the programs in the bus stops so people can't see the time, the timetables for when the buses come. And that's something people rely heavily on. Uh, folk might not have a smartphone to scan the QR code. So it's so important to have all levels of accessibility. It's, here we go. Deborah Wright, how can Queens get more bus shelters, long waits and rain and snow? We're going to definitely circle back with you, Deborah. Leave your contact information with my staff. Uh, we'll certainly coordinate with the MTA um, to make sure that we can get. Oh, oh, hi. There we go. Here. We were backstage. Um, so I heard the question, um, actually heard Ron's comment around investment uh, at Jamaica. And again, you know, those are deep capital program investments. Uh, we're always looking to develop those. So, you know, I would just say stay tuned, um, you know. For future capital programs to, to really make sort of those large scale investments in important hubs like Jamaica. Um, in terms of bus shelters and bus furniture, uh, those are not the responsibility of the MTA. Those are actually the responsibility of the Department of Transportation. So City DOT is responsible for the installation and maintenance of all bus shelters and bus furniture. So the benches and the lean the lean buys that uh, folks go to. So uh, I know that you said that Craig was going to be joining Craig Chen from DOT. Uh, Craig would be able to talk more about uh, DOT's investment in uh, bus furniture. Absolutely. And thank you for that, Lucille, because sometimes folks don't understand the distinction. Um, but for Ms. Deborah Wright, and I know my staff got her contact information, uh, and they're going to log that as a constituent request and figure out where Ms. Deborah would you like to see more bus shelters so we can communicate that to our city council colleague so she can then communicate that to the Department of Transportation on the city level? Thank you so much, Lucille, for helping make that distinction. Uh, we have a question or comment from Ms. Teresa Scott, who I love dearly, a resident of Redfern Houses and Redfern Houses Tenant Association. She says, some of the buses out here are, I guess she meant to say filthy. Some of the buses out here are filthy especially on 54th Street. I'm not sure if she's talking about the bus terminals, I mean the shelters or the actual buses themselves, um, but can we speak to the cleanliness of the bus shelters on um, the buses themselves, Lucille, and how folks can 
Can, uh, so again, for anything related to the bus shelters, that would be DOT. In terms of the MTA, um, you know, I think a lot has been talked about sort of our sanitation process, of, you know, through COVID. Um, so all buses at the end of their routes are thoroughly clean, sanitized. Um, you know, we're using the electromagnetic cleaners and cleansers and all kinds of things to keep folks safe. Those things have not changed since March of 2020. Um, but, you know, and if you see an issue such as, you know, human waste or someone has thrown up uh, on a bus or a subway, uh, we are required to take that bus or subway out of service. Uh, and so, you know, if you see issues like that, please bring that up to the operator. Um, that would mean that they would have to sort of stop the bus where it's at, let folks off, another bus would come and pick folks up, and then the bus would have to go back to its terminal to be thoroughly cleaned and then brought back into service. The same way with subways, if you see any kind of human waste uh, or, you know, someone has thrown up, uh, you know, blood, any of those things, you know, definitely, you know, let the conductor know they will shut the that train car and sort of isolate that train car so that folks can't enter it and then at the appropriate time, they can disconnect the car, uh, have it be cleaned at its terminal, and then brought back into service. Uh, so those are all things that you can speak with bus operators about, as well as the conductors for subways. And that's so helpful, uh, Lucia. So I'm so gracious that you answered that question in a way that people understand that there's a way, a process to make sure you report that thing. So if you see a dirty bus, see a dirty train car, report it to the conductor, report it to the bus driver, there's protocol and procedure. And if it's not being followed, report that as well, because we want to make sure that the safety of our constituents and the passengers are our top priority. Absolutely. In addition. So I want to read a couple of comments. Tanya has been extremely active. We love Tanya. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, you and Tanya should connect. Uh, she's a biker here in the district. Um, and she's here in Springfield Gardens in Rosedale. Her comment on YouTube was, let's take a serious look into micromobility. I'm not sure what that is. Um, Laura, you, do you know what micromobility is? Yeah, micromobility is bikes, scooters, electric bikes, everything that people are using um, to get around. That's pretty much everything between walking and uh, and a motorcycle. And and looks like, the, Laura, we got uh, Laren, who's been an active participant tonight, they commented on Facebook, more electric bikes and invest in e-cargo bikes. I know that we had a pilot program here in the district with Line Bike uh, and a couple other providers. So these are ways, again, for people to be able to get around the district, to get around the community. You want to speak to some of the partners who will be doing work uh, all across uh, the city, Line Bike. Um, I forget some of the other ones, but... Line bike stands out because I used to always scan my phone on the line bikes before they sadly left the Rockways. But in any case, uh, what what are some of these what are some of these ride shares doing around bikes and electric scooters? Can you speak to a little bit to that? Yeah, so these are especially popular for last mile trips. That's like I'm um, just home to your nearest bus stop, train stop, or just somewhere in the community. Um, as you, you all know, there's a city bike, which is taking a very long time to expand and cover all every community across the city. And so a lot of the um, Lime and others uh, piloted and really sort of filled this void um, in outer borough communities. And um, yeah, just saved people a lot of time and give them the chance to try electric bikes for the first time. Uh, the technology has come extremely um, far really quickly in the last couple of years. And now people can make all kinds of trips really quickly without even breaking a sweat. And they're truly, uh, they're truly car replacers in a lot of way and super, super fun. I'm excited. One of the first things I did when I got elected is ride one of those scooters. Um, they're so cool. Uh, and I was featured in the, the local paper in the wave riding one of those scooters. Um, but I'm not cheating on the MTA. I just want to let you know. Um, <laughs> together. Me, let, <laughs> working together. Um, Rachel, can you talk a little bit about 
um, the JFK redevelopment. I know we didn't get a question on it from the audience tonight. Um, Revel, thank you, Tanya. It was Revel. I couldn't think of the name of it. See, Tanya's on it. Uh, she's a true biker. Um, can you speak a little bit, Rachel, a, a little bit about the JFK redevelopment and how that's going to drastically impact travel here in the 31st Assembly District? Sure. Thank you. So it's really interesting. Uh, thank you, Member, for having this as well. Um, so again, my name is Rachel Antoine, the Community Outreach Manager for the JFK Redevelopment Program. It's really interesting to hear the different conversation around transportation. And we must not forget that, you know, the airport, you know, the JFK airport right at the, the heart of Southeast Queens and the members district, the heart of the members district is one of the major transportation hub right here in Southeast Queens. And also one of the main economic engine here in Southeast Queens. So I'm happy to talk about um, the JFK redevelopment program, which was a vision plan that was announced back in 2018. And that was to transform JFK Airport into a, you know, a modernized airport. And, and the reason uh, this decision took place was because of the outdated terminal um, sites that are currently at the airport, and also to accommodate the uh, upcoming passenger growth right here in Southeast Queens. So we know that a lot of folks are traveling and uh, in the upcoming years that this um, areas of this realm of transportation will be shaping. So this redevelopment program is actually a $15 billion private investment across four terminal development uh, uh, terminal developers. So we're looking at the new terminal one, which is a 9.6 uh, billion dollar uh, project to build a brand new terminal. And we're looking at terminal six, a $3.9 billion project to open a new ter uh, terminal by 2025. And the Delta JFK IAT, which is T4, which is an expansion and a renovation that is set to be open in 2023, as well as terminal eight, where American Airlines is, it's a $400 million expansion and renovation for 2022. So in this, you know, community briefing, we're talking, we're speaking about equity, uh, and it is part of my role here um, to ensure that part of uh, the member's role, who is a member of the advisory council for the JFK redevelopment uh, uh, airport, uh, co-chaired by our lovely congressman, uh, Gregory Meeks, and uh, our board president, uh, Donovan Richard, and assembly member Anderson and councilwoman uh, Selvina Brooks Powers, who played a key role and in, in making sure to see this project going forward. So when speaking about equity, uh, we must maintain a transportation lens around the aviation realm. And that is making sure that with a project like this in the community, that there are accessibility to resources, that everyone in, in the community is aware of the programs, is aware of the fair distribution uh, when it comes to resources, benefits, programs, and services related to the projects for the community. And I'll stop here, remember, if you have any further questions. Yeah, where's your office, uh, Rachel? Where can folks get connected with the JFK Redevelopment Project? whether it's uh, employment opportunities, whether it's um, um, anything, resources, anything. Sure, definitely. There are many more uh, resources that I would love to share with the community around um, opportunities for local businesses, for small uh, small firms and uh, concessionaires opportunities and construction opportunities and workforce opportunities around this project. So if you have any questions, please feel free to stop by our office. It is located at 144-33 Jamaica Avenue, New York 11435. You can also call us at 718-244-3834. And also via email, you can reach out to us at jfkredevelopment at panynj.gov. I believe someone is adding that on the chat and all of the social media um, website. Please feel free to reach out to us. And you can also visit our website for more information at www.anewjfk.com. There you will find all of the information relating to all of the four projects in our community at reach office, as well as um, being able to uh, have an appointment with a one-on-one -on -one appointment with our terminal developers and our consultant team at the JFK outreach office. Thank you so much for that very, very helpful information. I'm going to look at a few more comments uh, and, and uh, share them here uh, as we close out tonight's community conference for folks who are just joining us 
um, you missed it. But don't worry, you can catch it on YouTube. We record every one of our community conferences on YouTube. You can go back uh, as far as four months. I uh, was still trying to get those other links up and running. So we're really excited to talk tonight about transportation justice uh, and equity for our communities here in Southeast Queens. Want to just pepper in a few more comments uh, and um, just feedback from the audiences, um, from the audiences all across our different platforms. Miss Teresa Scott said, "When a, when it snows." Senior citizens and disabled people have a terrible time getting on the bus. We talked about that and making sure the bus shelters are safe in the MTA's role versus the DLT's role. Uh, so we're excited to to have um, to to have that that expertise and that insight. Um, we have a comment from Paul Trust um, speaking more about the Queens Link. We will get to that. Paul, trust me, we will get to it. We'll have that discussion. Tonight, we just want to focus on the local issues and we have our partners on the call. There will be time for that. And we have to make sure that we continue to expand transportation um, access to our community. So I'm with you. Let's let's keep building. Uh, Paul also says he loves dollar vans. Let's, let's get around the district. We like it. We like it. Um, and also, I think Alexandria, and this is, a, um, a I think it's, a comment directed more to Accessoride. CIDNY can help with AAR services in Queens and Manhattan. So that's an organization called CIDNY. Our folks will get that contact information uh, and make sure it's available on our, on our uh, various platforms for people who need assistance with Accessoride, um, you know, for the work that they do um, here in Southeast Queens and all across the 31st uh, Assembly District. So I want to thank all of our amazing panelists, panelists who joined us here tonight. We have Laura Shepard from Transportation Alternatives. Thank you so much for being here. We have Jacinta from uh, Gateway JFK who spoke about Dollar Ride. Thank you so much for being here. Rachelle from the JFK Redevelopment. And of course, Lucille Songhai from the MTA and all of her partners uh, and colleagues in the MTA who answered all of our questions tonight and will continue to work uh, in partnership, in collaboration, in community with our panelists uh, and all of our partners in government um, tonight. So I'm so thankful for all of you tonight. So I'm going to wave you all goodbye for now, um, but continue to make sure that we're in contact and in partnership as I close out tonight's segment. So thank you so much for being on and thank you uh, for your continued partnership. Thank you, Assembly Member. Thank you. Thanks, Have a good evening. Good evening. Bye, everyone. Thank good you. Evening. Good evening, everyone. All right. So thank you guys for tuning in every last Thursday of the month, 7 p.m. You can find me here on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, speaking about the issues that are critical and important to the 31st Assembly District. This month's community conference series was around transportation justice and equity. Let's face it, Southeast Queens and much of it and the Rockaways are a transit desert. And if we don't get our act together here in Southeast Queens to ensure that our communities have access to the very important transportation hubs, whether it's for economic reasons, whether it's for family reasons, whether it's for our community to be stronger and together, whether it's for quality of life, this is our opportunity um, to have brought stakeholders together. Uh, and it's going to be a continuous discussion on how we can continue to build, to grow our transportation infrastructure uh, in our communities. I will see you all, I'm sure, before next month's community conference series uh, every last Thursday this uh, upcoming month, February 24th, 7 p.m. We will be speaking on the issues of Black history. So, of course, we want to make sure that people are on, who are tuned in, uh, and who understand the importance of celebrating um, Blackness and its richness here in the 31st Assembly District and beyond. So I thank all of our audiences for joining. Let's continue to build out these different platforms. We tried out the Twitter space for the first time, so I'm really excited about that. Let's continue to build. Let's continue to have a transportation network, but a community that's self-sufficient, that uplifts itself, that's empowered, um, but it's most importantly has the resources and the tools to move towards uh, self-determination. Thank you, everyone. Be safe, be well, and let's continue to build.